Sam, stream is starting on YouTube. What's up? Oh, crap. Can they hear me? You guys can hear me, huh? Hi. You can't see me, but you can hear me. Watch this video while we wait for the show to start. Blah! Oh, there is no video. Do you know why? Because it's not there. So look at this blank screen and listen to my voice from the ether. Hello. TikTok. They can't see me, but they can hear me. You can see me and hear me. <laughs> the show will begin soon in like two minutes. Or maybe not. How about we just start this opening now? What's up? Shablam, what's up? And oh, it's blurry. There you go. Welcome back to Beyond the Northern Wall, your weekly talk show with me, your host, Kayla Malari, right here on the Chorus YouTube channel. I am dual streaming tonight, so I'm talking to you guys out on YouTube. I'm talking to you humans out on TikTok. Not to imply that people on YouTube aren't humans, because I did say that weird, but you're all humans. Maybe, I don't know, some of you are aliens, that could be a thing. But I am dual streaming, so I'll be talking to you and you. Welcome. If this is your first time beyond, to Beyond the Northern Wall, this is a weekly talk show where I kind of relate to you guys and we talk about anything and everything correlated. So we talk about anime, comic books, movies, but we also talk about the dance crew. We talk about fandoms that we're a part of, or I'll talk about anything that comes along with it. So all of our social interactions, any commentary on society or pop culture in general, just whatever's going on, just like Oh, did you hear that crack? Just like tonight, I'm going to be talking about leadership. So here's the deal, y'all. I have this whole thing and I'm going to try to follow this like stream of consciousness, but I'm also not going to follow this stream of consciousness because that's not organized. So I'm going to do my best for tonight. But I've asked in the past, woo, bars, for people to be like, or I've asked people what I should talk about on Be Beyond the Northern Wall because there's just a lot and it's trying to narrow it down. And a lot of the times I always get requests to talk about leadership. What's it like to be a leader? What's advice you could give a leader? What is it like leading your own cosplay dance crew? What's it like leading a dance crew? What's it like cosplaying? What, what are the ins and outs of it? And I always used to be super nervous about giving advice in general, like in a large capacity hasn't stopped me, but I always, always get super nervous about it. And I'm always very wary because I don't want my advice to be taken as like the absolute gospel because it definitely is not. It's just from my perspective. So a little disclaimer, anything I say tonight is from what I've learned as a human in a leadership position. And I've actually narrowed down how I perceive leadership into five main points that I'll explain later. But uh, before we get into the whole delving into leadership as a whole, let me give you a little bit of background on myself because who the heck am I? You know what I mean? Hi, my name's Kayla. 
I had more to say after that and then I blanked. So that was fantastic. Anyways, my name is Kayla Malari. As you know, I play Hanji for our AOT set on the Core Dance Crew. I also play Todoroki. Can you stand, boy? Okay, oh, he can stand. Okay, Toto, he's so precarious on this thing. They made his Funko Pop so top, not even top heavy, left heavy. Uh, so he doesn't stand very well. Ugh. And I'm one of the co-founders. I was a co-director for majority of CORE's duration, and I am the current CEO of CORE. Prior to leading the CORE dance crew, along with Sonali, who's the, the other co-founder, and then of course the rest of my board, I have leadership experience from so many other places. So we're gonna, I'm literally going to give you an annotated look at my leadership history. It all started, and I'm not kidding you, in second grade. I was the class representative in second grade in my elementary school. It was like, you know how you have like two class reps and that was the student council for my small elementary school. My sister was also in student council. So that's how I started. Second grade, I was the girl representative for my second grade class. And then in third grade, I was also the representative for student council. Side note, anecdote, second grade or third grade was when my sister and her friends volunteered me for Valentine's Day to dress up as Cupid, wear a diaper and deliver candy grams to everyone in the school. Like I don't get embarrassed easily even when I was a kid, but I had to wear a pink leotard and then a diaper and then the teachers thought it'd be funny if they stuffed the diaper with pillows to make me look like, you know, a little cherubim. It didn't look, it didn't make me look like a cherubim because they put it, they should have like stuffed my leotard with pillows, but they stuffed my diaper. So it looked like I poo pooed in my diaper and then was delivering candy grams around. But I got like a leadership award for that. So that was the beginning of my great leadership reward career. Anyways, fast forward on as I got into like middle school, I really tried to be take on more leadership roles. So not only did I always want to be a part of like the big decision making, so it was always student council was always a thing growing up. But then I always participated in anytime we had a school wide competition or something that was like uh, I remember in eighth grade, eighth grade, eighth grade, we had we got to participate for the first time in a district wide which was the whole Northern California wide science project that had to do with a new release of Sim City. And they were only taking two teams from all the elementary schools. And so everyone, and the two teams of three. And I remember I was like, I need to be a part of that. So that was something that I did that we got to do. So that was me all through like middle school. In high school, I did join the student body. I was a PR commissioner for, I think my junior and senior year. I think I was PR commissioner for sophomore year. I'm pretty sure I was. I also was the choreographer for my theater at for theater at that school, and I participated in a lot of the creation process, mostly my junior and senior year. I did all of the the performance productions. I was part of the prom committee when I was in high school, uh, and I was also part of homecoming committee, and like putting on the big events. So that was like me going into leadership in in high school. In my studio, I was you know once I became a senior in in the dancing, you know, hierarchy, whatever. Uh, I became one of the choreographers by the time I was 18. And then even into college, I was still dancing and I was one of the teachers. I taught at that studio to all the little babies since I was 15. 14 was when I started assisting teaching. 15, 16, 17, 18, up until I was 20, I wanna say. I was my own teacher at that studio and I helped with the competition dances. We helped the production side. I helped put on like the last two shows of the studio shows that I was a part of there. And then when I moved down to Southern California, it just moved on from there. I joined a hip hop dance team in the, in the collegiate dance scene. And then after a year there, I became the assistant artistic director for that team. I started my own team with Matt Groove, our Irwin Smith and our friend Paul. We started our own team called Reality Check. Uh, and then, and that's what led into, of course, Core Dance Crew doing this here. Outside in the professional world, I was, not only have I been a performer, but I was also the official last choreographer for Cassandra Peterson 
better known as Elvira, Mistress of the Dark. Her book's coming out. She's amazing. So I got to be her choreographer at Knott's Berry Farm the very last time she performed live at Knott's Berry Farm for Not Scary Farm. And I got to be on that creative side in the meetings and putting together the entire performance from like the ground up. So creation and leadership has always been something. And then of course, core dance crew, whatever. So that's like my whole annotated history of being a leader. So when I say, when I talk about being a leader, I'm drawing from these experiences. It's not something that I just took on like five minutes ago. It's something I've done since second grade. So that's where I'm coming from. Hey, yo. So leadership. I have like five points as a leader that I try to follow that I want to give to you guys. And then I like give like examples of it. I can't see my thing past my camera. I need to redo my setup because I can't see anything. I can't even see. All right. Leadership. Bam. Nope. You don't want to? You, you, don't, you don't even want to? Bam. There you are. Leadership. So these are my five points. I'm going to read it out to you guys here on TikTok. So number one is you have to earn the right to be leader. And I'll break these all down. Two, leadership requires certain sacrifices. Three, it's about support. Four, know everything. And five, knowing everything doesn't mean you're never wrong. So those are the five points. Let's start with point number one. Welcome to my TED Talk. This is not going to be the smoothest TED talk you've ever been to, but I will hope that it's probably one of the more entertaining ones. So the number one thing that I always tried to learn or what I gleaned as a leader is you have to earn the right to be a leader. Someone can bestow the title on you. Someone can say, oh, you applied for the job of director. You're now director. You've applied the job to be the, the choreographer or the head of this project that it, you are now that person. Yes, you can get the title, but you have to earn the right to be a leader. People aren't just going to treat you like a leader if all you did was get the title and that's it. You have to earn it. So you have to work so hard. And that coincides with point two, leadership requires certain sacrifices. To earn the right to lead, I've always known that one, you, you have to work so much harder than you actually think you do. And, and it's objective because whatever you think, whatever you personally think is the hardest you can work, you have to work harder than that. Two in this, uh, one thing that I noticed is that a lot of leaders that I, that I had to follow, not, not that I'm going to say that I looked up to, but I had to follow thought that being a leader meant that they could, essentially take it easy or they didn't have the same responsibilities as everyone else because they were in a leadership. No, what I meant by sacrifices is you sacrifice the luxury of like rest. You sacrifice the luxury to say, I don't want to do that anymore. You sacrifice the luxury to rage quit. Rage quitting is for, you know, adolescent boys on call of duty. That's for that. You don't get to rage quit when you're a leader because you're earning the right to be a leader. That means even when times get tough, even when everyone else is like, I don't have an, I, like, I, I can't handle this right now. The leader knows that when you step into that position, you have to sacrifice the luxury of being able to say that. It, it, it just, it is that. And a lot of times that's not to negate you as a human. Yes, you can react to things on a human level. Yes, you can be frustrated. Yes, you can be, you might not have all the answers, but you don't get, you don't just get to take a back seat because you chose to get in the driver's seat. You chose a leadership role and you're earning that leadership role. So you have to drive. Even if there's no more road to drive on, you now have to figure it out and drive. And that's what I mean by sacrifices. Cause a lot of people think once they like climb to the leadership position, they're like, oh great, I get to make all the decisions and it's so much easier cause it's what I want to do. And then when they're hit with barriers or obstacles, they're like, I'm not supposed to have to deal with that. No, you are, you are the first line of defense. You are the vanguard. I'm sorry, you, a boss sits at the back. Like you, we, this is not Imperial Rome, okay? You're not the legatus at the back of the army waiting quietly on your horse 
while the vanguard goes forward. No, no, no. We're talking like Braveheart. We're talking the old Nordic way of fighting. You are the leader, so you are at the front. You are at the dang front of the battle, and you are charging forward with the rest of your army, with the rest of your military. That's a real leader. A leader does not sit back and watch as things happen. They are in there getting to know the the work, getting to know the product, getting to know the hardships, the actual nitty gritty that everyone else who's following them has to do. And again, like I said, sacrifices. Other people get to, even the people who signed up for it, who signed up to follow you, it, it kind of sucks because they do get the grace of saying, well, now this is too much and I'm tired and I don't want to do this anymore. But the leader has to be like, okay, well, I, you still have to do it. You have to do it. One of the hardest things is when I say not taking rest, that doesn't mean, that doesn't mean in the bad sense. And this is, this is what kind of sucks with, with nowadays is the, is the manipulation and changing of how we look at things. Never rest. There's no rest for the wicked like that, that old school saying. It has a lot of connotations to it, but that's oftentimes given to leaders. That doesn't mean you don't ever rest. It doesn't mean you run yourself into the ground until you can't see anymore and you're like bleary eyed and you're like, I'm so tired, I didn't eat all day. No, 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 that's not what it means. No rest for the leader doesn't mean that you don't take care of yourself. What it means is you are constantly working, you're constantly building. You have to be to be so on top of everything. A great example was today. I have a, I was working remote from home. I have a lot of work on my docket. And then and then I took on responsibilities, just personal responsibilities. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna go do my own personal errands for the next two hours before this stream so I can get that all done and out of the way. So like once I sit down for this stream and I sit at this computer, I am now here for the rest of the night and I can just do all my work tonight. Well, the rest of the world doesn't get to do that with me like they don't get to listen to my scheduling because I decided to be the CEO for core so while I was out doing my own personal errands I'm getting messages and Coresman can advocate for this I'm getting messages of things that are like happening right in the moment and I'm like oh crap now I gotta like figure this out for core now I gotta go redo this scheduling now I gotta rework this and figure this out and I'm not in a place where I can do that. I'm not sitting with my planner and the calendar in front of me. I am literally out at Michael's trying to figure out if I want the sign that says, which better give my candy or hocus pocus. Like I'm just trying to get decorations for Halloween because this is the one day I can do decorations for Halloween. But my leadership role required me to change it up and now I don't get my personal time. Does that suck? Yes, it does. But it only sucks to an extent because I signed up for that. I signed up to be the leader. I chose to be in this position to build core into something and I became the CEO and took on that responsibility knowing that there would be times I'd have to drop everything I was doing in order to fulfill the role that I chose to be in. And so that's what I mean by sacrifices. A lot of people are like, no, this is my, this is my me time. This is my rejuvenation time. This is, I, I'm not going to deal with this. But sometimes things are time sensitive. And so you don't just get to put it on the back burner because you allotted today to be your thing. And that is a hard concept because a lot of people don't believe in that. That a lot of people won't agree with me on that. And that's fine. That's just how I've learned to work. And it's the best way for me to stay on top of things. But again, I had to come to a term in my head that said, you have to accept this and you can't be mad about it. Do I get frustrated about it? Definitely, 100%. Do I need to take a step back from things sometimes? 5,000%. And that's where number three comes in. It's about, what? Whoa, yeah, is everything okay? What does that mean? Sorry, I got distracted by the chat. What do you mean is everything okay? Did everything seem not okay? Uh, number three, it's about the support or it's about support. So being a leader, you have to surround yourself with a great support system. And at the same time, and this goes in life, this goes beyond leadership. You also have to be a good support system for others. A great leader 
knows how to be a fantastic follower. I've learned more about leadership by following other people than just calling the shots. And that is a true statement. There are so many people in charge. There were choreographers, artistic directors, executive directors on these hip hop teams that I used to be on that just wanted to be in charge and didn't know how to, didn't know how to support. They didn't know how to follow anyone else. Even if that another person was in charge and they were, we were in a different department and they were not in charge, they still didn't know how to follow. They didn't know how to support. Cause they're like, well, I'm a leader in this department and you're a leader in that department. And so I don't do that. I don't support you. No, a great, good leader knows, knows that there are two sides to every coin. You can't just have people support you the whole time. You have to be there for them especially when you're a leader. Your biggest concern, at least for me, the the CEO of Core Dance Crew, my biggest concern is my Coresmen. I have to put them at the forefront of almost everything I think about. I do, I, I do. I've. It's weird to say that I've conditioned myself because I also feel like there is a natural thing that I've you know, had to grow and develop over time and experience, but to naturally put people at the forefront of your thought process is something that should become natural and almost habitual later on. So that has to be a thing. I have to think about, okay, what's the best way to utilize the time so that you feel productive? Or what can I give you to help you through this? That is a great leader. Uh, my boss right now, at uh, I work at a Barnes and Noble, and my manager there, our store manager, he is amazing at this. He is probably one of the hands down most supportive people. One of my favorite examples is we we were we work in a in a border of a conservative city. Hey. And there's a lot of like liberals and there's a lot of conservatives. There's also a lot of kind of uh, typical shall I say close-minded people. And a lot of the times we do get people into our store, into our bookstore, that are none too kind. There was one individual, this woman came in and said some horrible things to one of my fellow booksellers because she asked her to put a mask on. She wasn't wearing a mask. The county requirements require you to wear a mask indoors. And my coworker asked her to put a mask on. This woman went far beyond. She started insulting my coworker about who she was as a person. Not even was like not even mad about the mask thing, but started like saying the rudest, cruelest, most inappropriate things to my coworker about who she was as a person. And our manager was like, "No, she is not allowed in the store." And the woman came back the second day and and the, our manager was like, you are banned from our store. And she was like, well, but your other bookseller said I, I could have one more incident. And he said, no, I'm the manager. You can't treat my employees like that. You're excused from the store. And that was amazing because so many times you'll meet managers that try to put customer service as their excuse for not, not fighting back with a customer. They're like, oh, it's customer service, you know, customer loyalty. But he was like, no, politeness doesn't mean you have to subject yourself to bullying and verbal abuse. That's not what that means. I'm your manager. I'm here to support my staff. We are, what I like to say is, especially when it comes to retail or even for restaurants, most especially in restaurants, we are merchants. We are not servants. You come into our area, you come into our restaurant, you come into our store. I am now a merchant. You are paying me for my goods and my services. I am not your servant. You don't get to treat me like a lesser human. It is an equal exchange. It is not a hierarchy at this point. And so if you come into a store or restaurant thinking that it's their job to serve you, that's not what it is. You're there for their goods and services and they're there to give you their goods and services. Equivalent exchange, y'all remember Full Metal Alchemist? That's what it is. And a good leader knows that you shouldn't subject your people to just, you know, be meek and be like, oh, you know, compliant and whatnot. Now that was something very hard. 
that I had to learn on core, especially because as a growing cosplay dance crew, there was no precedence to what we did. There was absolutely no game plan. We were blazing a trail, literally blazing a trail that's never been done before. So many times in the eight years of running core, I've run into this exact conversation with people where they said, what you guys do is amazing. What you, what you have, this cosplay dance crew thing, phenomenal. I just don't know what to do with it. Like, I don't know where to put you. I don't know how to utilize you. And that's a real thing. That was super hard. And so a lot of the times we felt compelled to be as compliant and adaptable as possible. It was a hard thing. It was a hard thing for me to push out of and it was a hard thing for core to build out of to just say yes to every condition there and this wasn't a bad thing it was more funny than it was anything else because it wasn't intentional on anyone's end but there was definitely a performance that core was at and it was for uh, a unified school district so it was for kids and it was like a festival for the holidays so we're like yeah we're gonna do this just for fun we'll perform for the kids well the stage uh wasn't like a secure stage the stage decided to Pangea underneath us. What do I mean by Pangea? Oh, good gravy goodness. I hope if I say the word Pangea, you guys know what that means. Because I just saw a TikTok where someone didn't know, uh, between Saturn and Jupiter, they didn't know what the largest planet in our solar system was, and that was upsetting. So I hope you know what Pangea is. Well, Pangea, if you don't know, was when all the continents way back billions of years ago was just one giant thing. We call it Pangea. And when we say Pangea is because, you know, during the tectonic plates, the movements of everything, that's when all the continents broke apart. That is literally what the stage did. As we are dancing on it, it is breaking apart underneath us. And I look over and I see Can drifting away on this piece of stage. We're not on water, mind you, this is on cement, but we're dancing so hard and the stage isn't connected to itself that it's just separating from underneath us. And we are dying laughing because we're like, what do we do? Technically, that's super not safe, but especially as a dancer, and this is definitely a professional thing, like in the industry, as a dancer and you know, as a live performer, you know the show must always go on. The show must go on. You hear it all the time. It's almost conditioned like that to the point where a lot of times someone needs to be there to be like, hey, stop doing this. It's not safe. The stage thankfully didn't collapse and collapse and no one got hurt. It was just when we got off, we were like, oh, that was super like, look at the stage. It's now spread out in this area. And we were laughing because we were like, why did we not stop? We just were like, let's figure it out. Let me just hop, skip and jump over here to my next part of the formation because the piece of stage that I need to be on is over there. And it was one of those things where like, well, but let's just, let's, you know, let's figure it out and let's do it. That is something that slowly over time, I've been able to discern as a leader, what can we do and what can't we do? And it's not necessarily can't as in we are incapable. It's more, how do I support my team in knowing and keeping them safe or making sure that they are properly compensated. Now there are some variations. If you slip on a stage, you can't be like, oh, we can't, like I slipped on a ball change. We now forever can't do ball changes. No, 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 no. Slipping and sliding, conditions where things are like all over the place. I, I can't tell you how many times in a professional setting a set has collapsed or crazy things have gone on around me and you've just had to make do. I was once, performing for, I performed for Electronica when Tron was coming out with Disney and Electronica was Disney California Adventures very first night party. It was like before Mad Tea was a thing. We changed that whole Hollywood back lot into the grid and I was one of the dancers and performers. We performed on this stage back there, back in that Hollywood lot. And there were these two giant walls that looked like, you know, electronic computer grid work. This is Disney, mind you. It was a great show. We're definitely like dancing and all of a sudden one of those walls slowly falls down and lands on the stage. And I'm, like this wall is a good 16 feet high. It's about three feet, th three feet thick. 
And when it landed, it just like, but like if someone had been caught under that, they would have been squished. Thankfully, no one was near it. But we literally looked at it. It makes the loudest sound. The audience is like, and we just kept on dancing. And now we're laughing because we're like, we have to just pretend that that didn't happen. So that's like something that I'm trying to take into is my experience also not being a leader as being a dancer as a dancer and now as a leader for dancers how can i marry the two so that's what i mean it's about support it's about understanding both sides of it how do i support them how do they support me what can i do to make their situation better but what can they do as my team to make sure that i can continue to lead us forward it requires really good communication if you don't have really good communication as a leader, I don't know what it is. And that goes into number four, know everything. Literally, you have to know everything and no one can know everything. So you have to do your best to know everything. So that means you have to be so communicative. It means you have to be so aware. You have to be working 25 nine to listen to everything. One of the things that I try to make sure I do, especially on core is I have to know how people are doing. If things are going on in their, like without delving inappropriately into someone's personal life, I need to know about their life so that I know, hey, are they having a hard time? Or I, I just did it last night. Trine Bean walked in and you, we all know that she had to go through her thyroid treatment. So I just asked her about that. I asked her about, hey, you know, how's the thyroid treatment going out, going on? And she updated me on that. She's like, of course, one of the most resilient people ever. So it was really nice just hearing her perspective on it. And then I know that, uh, Ryoko, Rio just came in with Joe and I know Rio has been moving departments in, in her job. And that was kind of like a, a really hard and difficult thing because she's, she's a super organized person and now she's in a completely new department and she's trying to work that out. And I was like, Hey, you know, how are you doing with that? How's that going? Especially because she also has a family and she just had her birthday or, uh, Lotus just had his birthday. Then I also know that my poor little our poor lovely Urban, our team captain, she just had her wisdom teeth pulled out, but then she's also working at Haunt for Knots. And so I'm like, man, she's just like majorly hustling. So, you know, gotta ask how she's doing. And then of course I gotta connect with my soulmate because me and my soulmate, we work so much on core, but I have to be like, hey, I need to know, like, how are you doing? What are you doing in your life? Some days if people, if we message the team or I message board and someone, one person is not responding, I like it if I know why they're not responding. They'll be like, hey, how come we haven't heard from this person? And I'm like, oh, they're actually at a wedding today because it's so-and-so day, it's this date, so I know that they're at a wedding. That's what I mean by know everything. One of the like cool flexes I got was, especially like costuming, when Core gets on stage, I want to check over everyone so I know who had difficulty putting their costume on, who's missing something they don't even know they're missing something. I have to know who has what prop. In the dances, even if I'm not in the combination, I know who's in that piece, or I try to know who's in that piece. It's so hard because you can't, like I said, you can't know everything, but you have to try to know everything. So that's why you communicate. If I don't know, if there's a spot and I go, okay, I know Joseph's next to me on my right, and I know for sure that Liz is right in front of me, but I can't remember who's right in this spot, but I've eliminated those two. I know that my soulmate is off stage and I know that Trine Bean's about to come on, so it's not them. So you gotta talk to the people around you. Joseph, who's your opposite? Bro TP, who's to the left of you? And that's where the communication comes in. You have to ask around, ask questions, because people aren't gonna give you answers unless they know the question. So if you expect people to just read your mind or if they expect you to read their mind, that doesn't work out. You have to say, one of the things that I love saying is use all your words. Don't just use like part of a sentence and assume people are going to know the rest of your sentence. You have to use all your words. So if you wanna know something, you have to ask and be like, I don't know who's here. I know it's not these and these people. I, I Who remembers, who can help with deductive reasoning? Deductive reasoning is the best thing you can do to know everything. But my little mini flex was we were doing San Diego Comic-Con and I and it was when we did Avengers. So we're all dressed in like a bounding version of Avengers. That's when I was Captain Marvel. Soulmate was Iron Man. Bro TP was Captain America. It was really cool. And I remember we were getting ready in the back and I look over at Rio and she's Spider-Man. 
And I go, hey, you're not where you forgot your your spider necklace and your earrings. And she was like, oh, I took them off because it was hot today and it was getting sweaty. And she was like, how do you know that I was wearing that? And I was like, I'm supposed to know because I checked your guys' cosplays. Everyone put together their own bounding cosplay of Avengers. But when we did a cosplay check, I, we looked over everyone. And so, of course, you have to look over everyone. If someone's like missing their jacket, I'm gonna know because I checked them beforehand and I had to make sure that I logged that away because as the leader, I'm supposed to know that. Again, are you gonna get it perfect every single time? Heck no, there have been a thousand and one times where I've been wrong, super duper wrong. Like foot insert mouth, wrong. Like mega trucking wrong, so wrong. And I also have to be okay with, with saying that. Oh, I was soups wrong. I was like super Megatron wrong and that's okay. What's, what's also something that you have to bite the bullet and you have to make sacrifices for is, especially for me, a lot of people say that I'm very rarely wrong so that when I am, they kind of get excited and they run with it and they kind of just kind of like, like really burrow in. They really make sure I know I was wrong. And they go, it's because you're very rarely wrong, which I don't agree. I'm not very rarely wrong. I'm wrong a lot of the times. It's just because as a leader, when someone else is right, they do get excited about it. So you kind of have to be okay with that. Like you can't take that personally because they're not doing it to make me feel bad. They're doing it because they're excited. They're excited that they got something right, that they're excited that they knew this. They are excited because they were doing all these things. They were being aware. They were being conscious of each other. They were being supportive. And so of course they're gonna kinda run with it. And so you have to take stuff like that. Like if you are wrong, that's okay. If you fail, that's okay. I absolutely hate when people say, failure is my biggest fear. Assuming that they've, they so that they never wanna fail. They wanna make sure that whatever they do, they never fail at. So that's, that's presuming that they've never failed before. I'm sorry, you fail all the time and you're, it's okay. It's weird when people, uh, Trixie said this to me last night. She doesn't like when people say, oh, they're not mistakes anymore. You know, they're just, you're learning from them. No, 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 you can acknowledge when you made a mistake. You can acknowledge when something was wrong. That's a, a real leader knows how to do that. Be like, that was a mistake. Not like, oh, you know what? Maybe that's not perfect and how I but I learned from it. You could still learn from it. You can definitely still learn from it. You should learn from it and you should always learn from it. But also acknowledge when something was wrong, when you were wrong, when there was a mistake to be had. It's weird to like, it's that weird toxic positivity thing where you're like, nothing's ever bad. No, 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 you have to, you have to know these things. That's part of knowing everything. It's knowing when to take the L, take the L, just do it. And that's where it goes into five. Knowing everything doesn't mean you're never wrong. It's like biting the bullet constantly. One thing that I take on personally, and I, I don't actually suggest for other people to take this on, but this is how I view my position on core. It's every success belongs to the team. Every failure or every non-success is my responsibility. Not to say that it's my fault, but it is now my responsibility. So if we, if, if core accomplishes something, hell, if I accomplish something, it is something that we as a team get to revel in. If I finished editing Immortal Bond, they'll give me my due diligence. They'll say Kayla edited it. You know, she did that on her own, but that's also an Immortal Bond is not my personal success. It is the success of the team because maybe they weren't in the room with me. They weren't sitting on the computer with me, but they were part of the creation process of it. They helped make that. I wouldn't have footage to edit if they weren't part of it. So it's understanding that even though you've probably accomplished something, it is a group effort in some capacity at some step of the way. But if something wrong happens, as a leader, you kind of, again, you're the vanguard. You put yourself in the position to take the hit. One thing happened at Anime Expo years ago, eons ago, Anime Expo. We had a tech. We had a tech for the Masquerade Halftime. Oh, this is for FMA set. You guys are so rude. Oh my God. Every time I talk, people are like, why are you stressed out? Why are you mad? Are you listening to anything I'm saying? 
Someone just put you look stressed on TikTok. That's kind of rude. <laughs> Why do I look stressed? I'm literally talking about something. Uh, anyways, that's how you know people don't listen. So as a leader, make sure you listen and don't just look with your eyes. Listen with your ears. Anyways, so we were at, F it was FMA. FMA year for Anime Expo. Oh, Koki's in the chat. What's up, Koki? Uh, it was FMA year and we had a tech time set aside for for our performance. Now, we're a masquerade halftime. So honestly, masquerade, it's about the participants. It's about the cosplayers who are part of masquerade. And so their tech time is important because they have to go in, you know, know when they're presenting and whatnot, practice getting on and off stage with their cosplays and doing their performance. It's really intense. And yes, as the masquerade halftime, like we have a lot to do. We have a lot of props, costume changes, entrances and exits. It's a whole ordeal. We definitely need a tech, but we also know that masquerade, it, we're there to celebrate the participants, the guests that are participating in the masquerade. So we were there for it. And there was a miscommunication. There was a miscommunication between the entertainment manager in charge, the techs who were running, the, the, like the technical assistants who were running techs for the contestants, and our runner, our den mom, say how to say. We were there the entire time and we were ready to go, but they kept pushing our time back. So we just kind of sat in, we like went into the audience area cause it was all empty and we were just stretching and working out. And I had sent our music in like weeks before, weeks and weeks before for the original performance. We actually had been asked to do that masquerade three days before AX started. So that was a last minute change. So I had to make a new mix. I sent it over three days before that masquerade day. Masquerade day. Sitting there, waiting for tech. Entertainment manager comes by and he goes, where's your music? And I say, oh, I emailed the music over to the technical department. And he was like, well, they don't have it. So you're supposed to have a hard copy of it. I was like, oh yeah, we have a hard copy of it, but our tech right now is at the same time as the panel we were supposed to be doing a panel at the same time so we had split into two different groups one group went to panel one group was at tech i was like but because that tech was so last minute we weren't able to change everything around so i was like yes we do have the hard copy but it's on the hard drive that's with our panelists right now at the panel he goes off he starts yelling at me 100 percent. this isn't my fault this isn't even the tech's fault this is no one's fault we were asked to do something last minute and now we're getting in trouble for it even though we did everything i had to just take that yelling it really sucked because i knew that the people who were going to get yelled at if it wasn't me wasn't even my team it was the techs they're standing right behind them and they were like trying to come forward and be like no 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 like this was our fault the the music is here but it, the format it was wrong that we gave her we actually said that we it was a lot of technical difficulties and at the end of the tirade the entertainment manager yelling at me we were able to clear it up and he apologized but here's the thing i knew as a leader i knew exactly where the entertainment manager was coming from he was stressed out his original this is this is what i know he was going through his original masquerade halftime performance had quit on him last second last second it was a huge name a huge name was supposed to refer for masquerade halftime last second they quit oh koki's remembering all this last second they quit brought us in we come in we're ready for tech all of the masquerade contestants are late they're late for their tech because the time that was given to them was an hour off and the main stage is an hour off because a panel went over time so now everyone's late everything is late we're getting closer crunch time is happening so everything needs to be so streamlined and he's dealing with all that stress and this was just one more thing it was honestly the the straw that broke the camel's back and that's where I had to pull into, I had to pull out of leader mode and into follower mode because I understood him as a leader. I was like, I know that you're stressed out, not even in a bad way. You're stressed out like a normal, like normally someone would be stressed out in the position that you're in. So I understand it. And I understand that this is super frustrating. So you yelling at me right now isn't even, I can take it because I know you're just trying to get the show 
on the move. And it's not anything personal. By the time we got to the end of it, I mean, other things happened. But, you know, we got that squared away. Everything was fine. And But that was a moment where I had to, I had to glean everything. I had to apply all of this. Let's see if I can hold it. All of this into one moment. I was like, all right, earn the right to be a leader. I have to set the example for my team. Not in the example as in, oh, be compliant and let him yell at you. I had to be like, no, let me go figure this out. Let me let me take on the professionalism, the shroud of professionalism that CORE always wants, and let me take this in the most diplomatic way possible. Leadership requires sacrifices. I didn't I don't get to pull the emotional card. And that's not to say that anyone who has an emotional overcapacity can't be in a leadership role. But if you have issues with anxiety, if you have issues with depression, if you have issues with any of that and you choose to go into a leadership role, then you have to do the work to make sure that you are capable to take on these stressful situations. If you don't do well with people who are high strung, you should probably not go into a field where people are high strung. And that's just an honest truth. That is an honest truth. I've, there are so many people, one of my closest friends in parades, he has crippling anxiety. And he is the most amazing person because he's like, but I chose to be a performer. He is diagnosed with anxiety. Not, he did not self-diagnose. He was diagnosed for 10 plus years with anxiety, he, he went to a regular therapist and a regular doctor. He had prescribed medication and he's like, and I do all that, I do the work so that I know that as a performer, I don't get to be like, oh, I'm having an anxiety attack right now, I can't go on stage. He's like, no, I decided to be a performer. So I have to do the work and do everything I can for myself so that I'm capable of doing this position that I wanna be in. That is the most, that is the whole point of normalizing the mental health discussion, by the way, is to make sure that people get the help that they're supposed to get. You're supposed to normalize it. That Okay, this is a side note. Now I'm just going on a mini rant. Approaching trauma should not be the, should not for the first time be on TikTok in a finger challenge. If you're doing a five finger challenge and it's the first moment you realize you have a traumatic experience, that should not be the first time. You guys, that's not what normalizing mental health means. That's not what it means. Normalizing the conversation of mental health means that health for your mind is health for your body. And just like going to a doctor when you have a broken bone, you should go see a therapist, a counselor, a doctor for your own mental health because it's the same thing. I'm not going to go on TikTok to get a diagnostic on my broken arm. Just like you don't go on TikTok to get a diagnostic for your PTSD. That's not where this should be. You go to a doctor, you go to a professional for stuff like that. And when you go into a leadership position, if you know you have anxiety, if you know you have issues with, with, with interaction or socializing, you have to take on the responsibilities that you're capable of taking on and do the work so that you can keep yourself safe and together while still performing your, your actions. There are so many people on CORE that are honest and talk about their mental health and are advocates for talking about it and normalizing it, but taking the actions in order to care for it. You can't just say, I have anxiety and do absolutely nothing to take care of it and then expect everyone to be okay when you are supposed to be setting the example. That is, that is something real. That is something honest that I'm telling you. I thankfully have never been diagnosed with anxiety. I've never been diagnosed with depression. I've never been diagnosed with any of these things. Thank God. They're not like, thank God in the sense where, because I talk to people, I talk to therapists, I talk to counselors. Anytime, especially when I had like my big injury on my knee, they say, Athletes who are injured are prone to depression, circumstantial depression. So I constantly talked with my doctor. I constantly talked with the people around me who had experience with it. So that I was like, okay, I can cite what I'm feeling. I know what's something that I can control and what's something that like is a chemical imbalance because that is a scientific thing. Oh my gosh, you guys, like it, ugh, maybe that should be a whole other thing. Mental health is such a complex and beautiful discussion that cannot be whittled down to just 
everything is is uh, i mean it, it, it's such a larger conversation we've twisted the normalization of mental health to the point where now everyone diagnoses everything and there's no backtracking there's no siding for everyone i mean you see with the vaccine everyone does their own research that doesn't mean anything you are not in the lab you are not writing a dissertation you are not doing research you're reading articles based off of this if you really want to know what's going on go find a professional if you want to know about a vaccine go find a scientist or a doctor if you want to know about mental health go find a therapist or a psychologist or a psychiatrist don't find user 56823,085p on TikTok and have them diagnose you. That's not how it works. Anyways, rant over. In a leadership position, it is possible to be a leader and have other things going on as long as you do the work and you understand that the position you're going into. That's what I mean about the sacrifices. I get burnout. I get, I get, uh, I think it's, I, I do have empathy p fatigue sometimes where uh, doctors are feeling it right now with COVID where you, you just can't feel sorry for people anymore. It, it's to the point where you're exhausted and being empathetic is something so essential to being a leader. By the way, being empathetic and being an empath are not the same things. That's something me and Trix always talk about. Everyone's like, I'm an empath. And I'm like, no, you're not because you're reading everyone wrong having empathy is different if you don't know that being an empath and having empathy are two very different things then you should probably try that science quiz thing on TikTok and see if you know what the largest planet is in the solar system because you probably need to double check your work my friend but having empathy is something i definitely learned as a leader but there is an extent to it because it is it is being able to discern when empathy should play in, into it and when practicality or pragmatism should play into it. Because you can't, this is something that happened with like Gavin Newsom. Oh, I almost died. Oh, I dropped my arm on my thing. Gavin Newsom got so many critiques about how he dealt with California in the pandemic. But here's the problem. Yes, is he a democratic governor? For sure. Unfortunately, we are not 100% individually democratic here in California. There are some Republicans, there are some Libertarians, there's some Green Party. So unfortunately, he has to consider everyone. And that's the hardest part as a leader, especially when, as an individual, like, and I'm not saying anyone on core does this, but this is my example. Someone on core will be like, okay, I know my schedule. I know I'm not available on Wednesdays. So I need to tell Kayla, I'm not available on Wednesdays. So I go, okay, I hear that. But now I hear as the leader, I also hear, well, you know, Bartholomew isn't available on Mondays and Judith is not available on Thursdays. And Beatrice is not available on Fridays and Archimedes is not available on Saturdays. So now I have, well, in their own respect, they're only not available on one day. In my perspective, I just hear that everyone is not available for the full week. So it's being able to portray that too, is be like, I know that it looks like what I'm doing isn't the best for you, but I'm trying to do the best for the whole. It's the whole versus the individual. And that's where you're playing empathy versus pragmatism and practicality. Now, if someone's like, I have an emergency, you know, something happened or I can't get out of work. That's where empathy and understanding comes into play. I can't just be like, yeah, leave work and come here. No, it's like, no, I un like, like with the entertainment manager at AX, was it right for him to yell at me? No, but can I understand where he's coming from? And I understand at what position he is in this sequence of events? Yes. So I can empathize with him and I can be, I can do my part and be one less stress on his end. Now, practicality wise, if it had kept going, if it had been just, you know, one yell at the, after the other, I would have stepped up and been like, Hey, we are doing our part. We are not the problem, which it was. I was like, we are doing whatever we need to do. Now you can move on to other things and just know that we are ready to go. 
So that's that's what it is. I, I was there a sequence of events? Was there any sort of cohesion to what I said? I hope so. I hope that did help in some capacity. Um, my take on leadership. If you have any questions in these last ten minutes, go ahead and shoot it out. Uh, you can do it in the chat or here on TikTok. Kayla, a question. You are the leader of the core. Yes, I, I am the CEO of the core. I am a co-founder of the Core Dance Crew with Sonali. Sonali is also the co-founder. But there is a board. There's a board and system. Sonali is the artistic director. So she's like head choreographer. She helps create the sets, the costumes, the pieces, makes the big decisions creatively of what we do on Core. We have a team captain, which is Urban. Urban is in charge of the team. So just like a dance captain is, she looks out for the team. She's the one that the team communicates with. So if they have issues with scheduling or there's emergency or they have questions, it goes to Urban and Little is the one who answers them. And then she, if she needs to relay anything to the rest of the board, she does that. And then we have an executive assistant, which is Liz, my bro TP. Liz is the executive assistant. So she helps out with kind of every department. She helps do a lot of the clerical work she helps take notes a lot of in a lot of our meetings. She also helps run the social media. Me as CEO, the only reason I took on the role of CEO is because most everything is under my name and I do the I make the big overarching big picture decisions. So, especially because it can't always be a democratic de decision making process like old Rome was ideal, but we can't vote on everything all the time. That's why a democratic republic was the original like, did we all not learn that? The original government system that we had in place was a democratic republic where a democracy voted and decided on leaders and the leaders, based off of what the people wanted, represented. The fact that we have a democratic and a republican, like, separated party is so bananas because they're supposed to be the same thing. Isn't that weird? Look it up. Look up ancient Rome. Huh? Our... our our blueprint for everything and then we botched a simple system anyways uh, how did you know you were a leader I didn't and that's where it kind of gets iffy I chose leadership roles but I don't get to decide if I am a leader or if I'm a good leader I just have to do my best and it's whether people follow or people trust me to make the big decisions is how I know if I'm doing a good job. I don't get to say, I'm good at leading. I don't get to say that. I'm just sharing my experiences. It is Korsman, it is the trust they give me, it is me earning this spot time and time again that determines whether or not I am a leader or even a good leader. So that's how I, I look at it. I don't get to decide that thing. Just like people are like, are you good at, at giving advice? I don't get to decide if I'm good at giving advice. Other people get to decide if I'm good at giving advice. You know? Aw, thank you, Luna Justine. I think you are absolutely doing a good job. Thank you. I try very, very hard, and I learn from a lot of people. Everyone I meet in my life is a lesson in how to be a better person, a better leader, a better choreographer, a better human being, empathetic, understanding, that whole thing. Structured and have the great mentality and mindset. I hope so. I, like I said, worked really hard. How do you deal with that burnout you mentioned? Ooh, burnout is real. I can't say that I deal with it great every single time. Burnout is such a real thing when you're in a position where you're making decisions constantly. There are, there are legitimately some days where I yell <laughs> because I, I I can't understand why it's not ending and I'm like oh my gosh I've just been it's just been plowing forward why do I feel like I have no help right now why do I feel like I'm just alone on this desert island and that that's the burnout talking I have over time had to learn that when I feel burned out it's not like I take a, a siesta it's not like I'm just taking a mini vacation and I'd be like, oh, I don't want to do any of these responsibilities. I have to know what I'm capable of. So I have to make sure that in a day, I get the things done that make me happy. So, and this is what I mean. My burnout is, it, it, it manifests in exhaustion. So I have to sleep. 
or it manifests in loneliness. A lot of times my burnout manifests in loneliness where I feel just really alone. And so I need to connect. I know that the best way to fix that is to connect with people. First and foremost, I go find Rostin. He's my number one connect physically. I have to go find him and I just like hold him and grab him. And that's how I center myself. Or I'll call up my sister. That's a big thing. I'll call up my sister, Tiffany, and connect there. Or soulmate, my soulmate. We, we have soulmate dates. We try to find times. It's few and far between. But we try to find times where we don't work on core because it's very natural for us to work on core. We try to find soulmate time where it's just us being soulmates because that burnout can be real. It's because I chose to intertwine core so intimately with my intimately with my life that the fibers are so like pulling my life away from core is doing this. It's just they're so intertwined. Which is crazy cuz if it means I burn out like I can't take a vacation from my existence. <laughs> so it is it's managing that and and knowing knowing when you're capable of something, knowing when you're not capable of something. You have to say no. You have to be okay with the fact that you're not always going to be strong. There are times where you're going to feel weak. And some people are like, no, but you're so strong. No, 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 no. It's okay to be weak. It's okay to be like, oh, I, I can't. I just can't. I can't right now. I can't. I want to sit down and watch a scary movie. And I just have to do it for an hour. And you can do that. You can do that. Shirk your responsibilities. No, 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 no. If you have like a time frame and you decided on this time frame and you're like, I have to get this done in a certain amount of time, you don't get to rage quit again. So you have to be able to balance that scale. Um, but that is a really hard question. That's something I'm still learning. Definitely. River Rose. Thank you for that question. If you have any other questions about leadership, shoot them out right now. I'll answer them as I do these announcements. So of course, for CORE, we've had some amazing collaborations come up. One of our big ones right now is Kaibin Zero. Look up here, go follow Kaibin Zero. They made these, look at this, this awesome, oh, I can't pull a cord. This Chainsaw Man hoodie, this, I got this from Kaibin Zero. Look at this, this is all, they designed it, they screen printed it. It is clean, look at that drip. Minimalism drip. On the back, if you guys like Chainsaw Man, they also have a Shigaraki line that's dropping on the 24th. Wait, that's like soon. This is this, 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 this week, it's dropping this week. It also like super detailed. So follow Kaibin Zero on Instagram and you can order straight from their shop. We also have a great collaboration with our lovely, lovely Fandomaniacs. Yo, let me see, let me show you this. This Attack on Titan jacket. I have my Tanjiro one is in the car because I wear it all the time. Do you see this? Season four, Attack on Titan. What's up? Fandomaniacs, y'all. Their, their cosplay bomber jackets are amazing. So cool. Use our promo code CORE10, C-O-R-P-S-1-0 to get 10% off of your purchase. But honestly, like peruse their site. They have Christmas sweaters coming out. Yo, they have a Sailor Moon Christmas sweater. I know some Corsmen don't know that and they just found out right now. It's awesome. Head over to Fandom Maniacs. Follow them on TikTok, Fandom Maniacs, F-A-N-D-O-M-A-N-I-A-X. Fandom Maniacs with an X. That's who you wanna follow. They have some awesome merchandise. Um, and let me see, questions. Aw, thank you, Beliana Toro. You are an inspiration. Thanks for sharing your experiences. I think you're such a good leader. Thank you. If you're not just brought a Genshin cosplay, you'll be buying so much right now. <laughs> oh, if you had not just bought a Genshin. Yo, but those Genshin cosplays, those designs are really nice. Anyways, I'm gonna have that over there for now. So those are our two collaborations that are going on. If you'd like to support Core on a more regular basis, you can always become a patron our Patreon is under the Core Dance Crew. You can access our secret Facebook group for as little as $2 a month. Uh, $5 a month, you get a 15% discount on our Core merch. We're coming out with some cool new merchandise for the holidays um, and just in general. And when you get to 
to ten dollars a month you get a free gift with every pop shop live order and you also get your name and business and logo on our affiliate officials club page so there's a lot of cool things you can get with patreon i think our exclusive for this month is a live chat exclusive only to patrons so they'll be going live you get a special private zoom link you get to chat with us uh, sometimes we have game nights sometimes we have we just did what was it our battle of the hogwarts houses that was a really fun <laughs> that was a really fun patreon exclusive I, I and also i really love the patrons a lot of the patrons have just become really great friends like honest to god genuine great friends sarah rocky sora uh ali uh, ariana not ariana well ariana too Alon Aldana, I am getting everyone's names mixed up. Cat, Queen Kitsune, Diamond, like these are genuine friends. They're because they're great people. So if you want to have some great people in your life, join us on Patreon. They also have a special Discord that's open to all comrades. You don't have to be a patron to be part of the Discord. If you want to know, go find a comrade that's uh, all over the place they're out there they will invite you to the discord and you guys can just chat honestly just about like cosplay and anime in general it's just it's a really great community it's funny because i didn't mention cal because cal is not cal is is part of court <laughs> in my head cal is a corsman i don't know if you know that cal but you're a corsman and rocky owns us <laughs> phyllis also is a corsman phyllis is a course phyllis and cal are corsman Sora is management. Sarah is just my emotional support Capricorn. Rocky owns us, you know. Queen Kitsune is going to be out here soon. Diamond is a Corsman. You know what I mean? Like, these are just, they're great people to get along with. How has it been for the crew since the pandemic? The crew has been really great. We actually have a lot of amazing things coming up. Even today, what I was talking, oh, my camera. Even what I was talking about, in the last half hour, some amazing messages have come up. I'm trying to focus my camera. Come on. This is the problem with having an autofocus. Autofocus. Go open my eyes. Wide. <laughs> In the last half hour, some amazing things have happened for CORE. And so it is constant. We have a lot of great things coming up. I'm super excited. And if you want to see what's coming up, you can check out our website thecoredancecrew.com or more importantly follow us on instagram the core dance crew on instagram we do a lot of tiktoks but all of our upcoming performances or any projects we're doing is right there it goes right on our instagram first and foremost so follow us on instagram for all your up-to-date knowledge any last questions emotional support capricorn really is great all right how do you stay motivated to keep dancing i stopped ever since i graduated and wish to get back in that is honestly something you have to find with yourself you can get inspired by a lot of things to get that motivation back it just takes the right the right concoction of of performances or music it can honestly be anything but go seek it out go look for go look for inspiration go on youtube so many dancers have created so much content TikTok is amazing. People dance on TikTok all the stinking time, and I'm inspired just scrolling. I'm like scrolling for hours, and I'm like, oh my God, that was so good. Or like, I just found a guy who did like a bunch of celebrity impersonations, and it just reminded me how much I love acting, and I was like, oh my gosh, you've inspired me because you're so talented. Honestly, humans <laughs> are a great motivator. Other humans and their talent are a fantastic motivation. So... So that's it for actually Beyond the Northern Wall. I'm a little late to our next meeting. We're having a soy sex meeting right now. Thank you all for tuning in. This has been fantastic. If you have any comments or questions about leadership, go ahead and throw it down in the comments once this live gets posted onto our YouTube channel. And I will see you all next week. Same time, same place. Right here on Core's YouTube channel for Beyond the Northern Wall. Let's call it out. Sotomato on three. One, two, three. Sotomato. Thank you all for tuning in. Thank you, Bro TP and Koki, for tuning in. I'll see y'all later. Peace out, A Town.